We'll hear from uh, award-winning environmental researcher and Australian Laureate Fellow, Professor Leslie Head, on the dilemmas of household sustainability. And Leslie will also be conducting a little quiz at the end, um, or actually during the middle of the presentation to test your knowledge, and there'll be some prizes, namely chocolate. Right, but uh, as I said, we do have to finish 6.30, but there'll be time for some brief questions towards the end. Um, just there's a flyer on your on your tables if you want to grab one for future uni and the brewery sessions. Uh, don't forget to join us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, if you could all switch your mobiles, mobile phones off, please. Um, and um, thank you, Leslie. Thanks, everyone, for coming and. Is the sound alright? Yes. Yes, so start waving your arms if uh, the sound drops out or anything. Um, I'm drawing tonight on collaborative work from a whole large group of people, some of whose names are on the screen and some of those are here tonight. Households are an increasing focus of government policy in relation to sustainability and climate change issues. And I think we're all familiar with the range of technological fixes that have been subsidised at the domestic scale over the last few years. Some of these have been big, home insulation, solar power, water tanks and so on. And some of them have been small, like shower timers and light globes. Now it's for good reason that these are supported. Households do make significant contributions to the greenhouse gas emissions in affluent countries. But it's really not easy to track these or to measure them. So the calculations vary, for example, depending where you assume the responsibility for different activities lies. In Australia, households contribute 13% of our national emissions if we only think of direct energy use within the household but 56% if we include all the goods and services that flow through the household. So the disparity between those two figures, 13% and 56%, is something of a metaphor for us in the difficulty of thinking about household sustainability. Yes, it's partly an issue of data measurement, but there's also a broader conceptual challenge. How should we think about these configurations of people who are shifting and complex in social and ecological ways. Now, education campaigns often promote the idea that it's easy being green. These policy approaches, we think, can ignore the politics of everyday life within households and the way households are connected to broader social and economic structures. They can treat the household like a bit of a black box that if you just pour the right education materials and technological fixes in, everything will be fine. So how many of us still have a shower timer stuck on the glass? And how many of us actually still using it? So the dilemmas that we're talking about tonight and thinking about tonight operate in multiple layers. Partly it's about thinking about different kinds of footprints. Is wine or beer the best ecological drink to have at uni in the brewery? Should we have paper books or e-readers? Should we have plastic bags or green bags? So that's one layer. But sustainability itself is a contested concept and sustainable practices don't always have a green label on them. So old-fashioned frugality and not wasting things is actually more sustainable than all sorts of green consumerism. And the best way to reduce your carbon footprint is actually to be poor. So there's a dilemma. In the Illawarra, there are further dilemmas that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Why should we worry about turning our lights off when the coal trucks keep running up and down Mount Oosley Road and the coal keeps coming out of the ground? So in Oscar, our specialty is not doing life cycle analyses as such. What we spend time on is analysing how those products and technologies and habits get furled up in the everyday lives of households. Households who are for the most part focused on things other than sustainability and how these households interact with the social and economic structures of the wider world. 
So in our team project, Making Less Space for Carbon, a range of staff and students are taking a closer look at these issues and a number of connected projects. Now our work is focused on the Illawarra and the Illawarra is a great place to do this research. It's a climate change hotspot because of coastal change, bushfire change and so on. We all know it's carbon central because coal and steel are central to the economy of the place. And it's a very socio-economically diverse community. So our range of methods has included uh, a representative survey that some of you probably participated in a couple of years ago. Uh, a long-term ethnographic study of about 20 households and a variety of spin-off projects that you can see there, many of those being undertaken by students. So tonight I'm going to use examples from the two involved there, the question of who does the work and the example of water. So our basic argument here is that you need to understand what's going on in the black box of the household in order to make these policies effective and to get different kinds of initiatives ratcheting together in the same direction. So it's about putting the everyday rhythms and temporalities and tensions of life in the foreground. The things that we all take for granted but that drive our everyday life. So let's think about what's going on in the black box of households at 5.30 in the evening. Not the most family friendly time to have a uni in the brewery, but I guess it's better than the morning. Everyone's tired and hungry basically. So some people have been unable to attend tonight. Some have left partners coping with the dinner and bath and some have brought their kids. So welcome to all the kids who are able to be here. And one family who's kindly agreed to participate tonight is the Buckman Morris family. Sol, Rowena, Kai, Liam and Isaac. Now, these, this family was participants in the Sustainable Illawarra Super Challenge Program in 2008-2009. The Super Challenge Program encouraged households to become more environmentally sustainable, by doing such things as refusing plastic bags, composting, establishing veggie gardens and catching public transport. The marketing material said things like, no matter where you're at, you can take the challenge to see just how easy it is to take control of your ecological footprint. You'll be surprised at how little time it takes to make a difference and how good it makes you feel. So Sol and Ro were part of a group in the program who also agreed to be part of Vanessa Organo's time and gender analysis for her 2009. Are oh, the chips are ready? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see. <laughs> for her 2009 honours thesis. <laughs> so they had to be highly motivated on two fronts: one, to enter the super challenge and secondly to agree to Vanessa probing into their lives. So I should explain that all the participants in this particular study were couples with young children, with the men in full-time paid work and the women combining full-time parenting with uh, at most part-time paid work. And Sol and Roe explained an important part of their motivation as being to educate their kids. To expose them to things like veggie gardens and chooks and so they understand where things come from. So they'll be able to tell you where their chicken nuggets come from. And <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, Vanessa found that while men were often responsible for the labour and upfront time required to start a research, <laughs> to start or research a sustainability project, for example, building a veggie garden, the responsibility of everyday implementation and changing habits commonly fell to women as part of their roles as mothers and household managers. And this is illustrated in a video clip that Roe recorded one night just before she was going to bed. So just a slight um, technical shift here. Switches up. One of those jobs next door. 
at night. Part of her job is to teach the kids to do things like switch off their computer. We also saw the recalcitrant technology. Who's going to switch everything off at the wall every night when you have to move all the furniture to do that? The other thing we saw is the methodological challenge for us as researchers in getting inside household dynamics. And so here we saw an example of video diaries being used as a method for people to, to document their own households. But of course that's got um, constraints on it as well. In the overall study, Vanessa found that women spent more total time on sustainable practices and did so more often. They experienced time as overlapping and fragmented, with no distinction between work and leisure. Men's contributions related mostly to gardening and transport in longer blocks of time, usually understood as leisure activities. I'm sure these are familiar themes to you in these households, Sustainability became a gendered practice as an extension of the gendered division of labour in the home. But it's not all about how much time, it's also about different sorts of time. So to say that sustainability takes work is not to say that people don't enjoy it. Uh, and Roe described some of these elements of quality time that she's now going to um, read for us. This is a quote. In a big voice. Oh, would you like to... Yeah, thank you. Hello. I look for what I can do that makes me happy. And the more I garden and ride a bike to go and get the fruit and veggies, I think, well, that's what's making me happy. I saw the veggie garden that I was digging up at the time as a way of getting exercise, which I needed back then and I still need right now. Okay, and both Sol and Roe talked about the importance of tuning into the cycles of time in nature. <coughs> yeah, well, in terms of uh, cycles, so I was of the opinion that there's going to be a whole generation of people that are uh, going to be so out of touch with nature and um, where our energy comes from that um, when, when we get a big shift like rising um, petrol prices or, or some sort of environmental catastrophe, um, we're going to have a whole um, bunch of people that, are, that, are, that don't know where their food comes from or um, they don't know how to rely on their own backyards or, or the resources in their own backyard. So, I want my boys um, to understand a bit about nature so they can adapt to, um, to changes in the future uh, rather than being reliant on, on going to the supermarket to get everything. And right. Every year we kind of take on a little bit more and more and then eventually you end up going 100 miles per hour trying to get it all done. But if you just stop, plan to see, watch it grow, pull out a few weeds, it can actually be really relaxing. And then you start thinking, you know, it really doesn't matter if I don't hand that assignment in. So many years later, I'm going to be saying, I've got something to eat. <laughs> and the relationship between the initial investment time and the maintenance or habitual time is illustrated in the story of their chook shed and chook run, which Sol spent quite a bit of time building. <laughs> but Roe is going to comment on. Yeah, all that hard work on the chookies, but you um, reap the rewards later on. We've always got food in the house, we've always got eggs, so we don't have to do that run to McDonald's to keep the little ones happy. It's much quicker just to boil up an egg and then the kids are quite happy. Okay, so that was three years ago. Let's ask Ro and Sol for a quick update on how things are going with the chooks. How do you like sitting down to dinner watching the rats run across the yard in front of you? <laughs> it was a bit of a dilemma. When you have chooks, you 
you off to get rats. So the chooks have kind of gone to a new home for a little while. Only because you've got to put a lot of time into chooks. It is nice to go in there and, you know, get the eggs, but you've got to clean out the food, you've got to feed them the right food. And the rats really like the food as well. So it was becoming a bit of a chore. And because the rats were eating the chooks food, the chooks needed more calcium, so they started eating their eggs. So we stopped getting chook eggs, so we're putting all this time in. We weren't getting eggs, we still weren't going to McDonald's though. And um, so something had to give for a little while. So the chooks have gone on a holiday, and later when we get back from another trip we're going, we do plan to have chooks again. Soul's version. Well, I'm just going to add to that. The other aspect is um, when you go away for a holiday and getting someone to look after the, uh, the animals, it, it takes a certain person to come in and you know, call through the chook zoo and collect the eggs and, and so on. So you need a network of people around you that are willing to sort of cover for you when, when you go on a, on a weekend away or a week away or something. Thanks very much. And we will get chooks again. <laughs> and we will finish that PhD too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a big thank you to uh, Sol and Rose. <laughs> so rather than a black box, we've started to think of the household as comprising a set of overlapping physical and metaphorical spaces where all these things jostle against each other and also with the outside world where we can think of friction and traction occurring. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about those 